Greetings, everyone, from Washington, D.C. I'm James Foster, co-director of the Institute for International Economic Policy at the Elliott School of International Affairs at the George Washington University. Thank you for joining us today for our second installment of the 13th Annual U.S.-China Conference, a panel discussion on Recovering from Pandemic Recessions, featuring John Rogers of the Federal Reserve Board and Michael Song of the Chinese University of Hong Kong. In just a moment, I'll call upon my colleagues, Maggie Chen and Remy Jedwab, to describe our conference and moderate today's proceedings. But before then, I'd like to thank several partners who made it possible our, our today's event. First, we are grateful for our two co-sponsors in the Elliott School, the Seeger Center for Asian Studies, which has the goals of supporting research on Asia, promoting interaction and education uh, for the next generation. And in the School of Business, GW Cyber, the Center for Business, Education, and Research, promoting an understanding of institutions, inclusive globalization, and U.S. competition. Second, we thank Elliott School Dean Ilana Feldman, the Dean's Advisory Board, and many others who've supported the Institute's work throughout the years, including Frank Guang and Ning Li, and other key supporters who might be with us today. Again, thank you for your sustained efforts. And finally, to our IIEP team, operations manager Kyle Renner, and dozens of GW students in events, media, and research who make sure that the trains run on time. Thank you for your extraordinary service in this time of pandemic. Now, for those of you who've not yet participated in an IAP event, you can expect a lively and informative conversation on such topics as urbanization, multidimensional poverty, global economic governance, green finance, and digital trade. Our Facing Inequality webinar series is a multidisciplinary conversation on what is perhaps the main socioeconomic challenge of our age. Our Envisioning India series convenes experts from finance and economics to paint a vivid picture of this important economy. Next month, Pranab Bardhan and discussants Michael Walton and Jean Drez will join us for a conversation on the role of capitalists in India. And just yesterday, we initiated the inaugural event in our Rethinking Capitalism and Democracies series, a conversation with Ralph Shamis and Connell Fullenkamp on how markets might value the world's living natural resources, such as whales, elephants, and marshlands, and mobilize resources for their preservation. Be on the lookout for the next installment in each of our series on our website at iiep.gwu.edu, where you can also find links to the massive outpouring of work by IIEP affiliates on COVID-19. Meanwhile, if you miss an IAP, just dial up our YouTube channel, IIEPGW, to relive the experience asynchronously. The moderator of today's event is my colleague, GW economist Remy Jedwa, whose work on economic development and history and urbanization has pushed him to the highest tier of global experts in this area and these areas. He also is a thought leader on the impact of pandemics throughout history, having just organized a timely symposium in the Journal of Economic Literature on this compelling topic. I'll now hand over the mic to another colleague, GW economist and former IIEP director, Maggie Chen, whose research continues to transform our understanding of international trade. Her most recent work uses online experiments to reveal the ways in which attitudes toward globalization are being formed and changed. Maggie also has the lead role in organizing our US-China conference and will now say a few words about its aims and history. Maggie? Thanks, James. Welcome everyone to our 13th annual event on US-China economic relations and the China's economic development. Over the course of weeks, Co-sponsors, alumni, and the Ningli Family Endowment, IAEP has successfully built a leading forum in Washington for addressing issues critical to the two countries' economic relations. 
This annual event has featured over 100 leading specialists and uh, scholars and practitioners, over 50 panels, and attracted over 2,000 participants from around the world. This year, we will host a year-long series of virtual events kicked off by Professor Carmen Reinhart in October, the current Chief Economist of the World Bank and Professor of the Harper Kennedy School. Professor Reinhardt discussed her latest research on China's overseas lending and the implications for um, developing countries. A couple of weeks ago, we had a signed panel together with the alumni team with two extraordinary GW alum, Mr. Frank Wang, president of Scholastic Asia, and then Mr. Chris Fassner, president and founder of Trans Technology. The panelists have shared with us their unique industry insights on international trade in the Asia Pacific region amid US China tensions. Today, we'll switch gears to another very important topic, and that is the economic effects of the pandemics. We're pleased to welcome two distinguished speakers, Dr. John Rogers from Federal Reserve Board and Professor Michael Song from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. My colleague, Professor Rami Jadwa, as James mentioned, will moderate the event. All three panelists have done important new work on the pandemics, including both historical pandemics and the current pandemic. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to uh, Remy, who will introduce the topic and uh, his research and the speaker today. Thanks, Remy. Hi, everyone. So my name is uh, Remy Jadwa, I'm a Nested Professor of Economics at GWU. And I myself have worked on um, the effect of pandemics. Uh, we focus on past pandemics and we say past like, a few centuries uh, ago. And so, for example, you can find in the Journal of Economic uh, Literature um, this paper called The Economic Impact of a Black Death. Uh, it was part of a four paper symposium. So, we have one chapter on the economic impact of the 1918 influenza one on the economic impact of modern pandemics, including Ebola, HIV, and there's one on uh, pandemics and inequality. I've also a different paper with Paul Romer, who was a former chief economist of the World Bank, and one of our GW colleagues, Roberto Samaniego, where we look at the impact of COVID-19, but on uh, long-term uh, human capital accumulation. So we look at the impact of like, school closures on human capital, but we also look at the impact of unemployment, with unemployment a lot of young people and not finding jobs. Um, and as a result of that, they're accumulating less work experience. Um, and work experience is human capital as well. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. I'm going to introduce the two speakers for today. Uh, that's why I'm really interested in this topic today. So uh, we have two speakers. Uh, the first speakers will be John Rogers. Uh, John Rogers is a senior advisor in the International Finance Division of the Fed. Uh, John was in academia before. Uh, was a necessary officer of economics at Penn State University uh, and has become a section chief at the Fed in 2003. Uh, John specialized in international finance and microeconomics. Uh, John still likes to teach, he's teaching at Georgetown University. And I think his most impressive achievement is the father of five children. Uh, there must be a lot of work, especially these days. Um, and then the second speaker would be Michael Song from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, he's a professor at the Department of Economics at TUHK. Uh, he's also um, a fellow at the Faculty of Social Science at TUHK and a co-director of TUHK Tsinghua John Fraser Chapter of the Chinese Economy and also visiting professor at Tsinghua. Uh, he focuses on the Chinese economy and macroeconomics. He has some very well-known papers. One of them is uh, this paper growing like China that I know um, that I know I knew about I knew about the paper even before knowing. Uh, Michael, uh, and you know, I, I really look forward to hearing from um, both of them. So we're going to have like uh, 25 minutes for both speakers. So I'm going to give the floor to John first, and then after that, we'll have a Q&A of 30 minutes. So if you have any question, uh, if you can send them to us in the chat <coughs> box or the Q&A box, and I will uh, collect all the questions and ask them on your bill. Thank you. John, is for you. Thank you very much for the introduction, Remy. And uh, it's nice to hear about your work too. It gives me uh, it gives me an additional uh, citation to, uh, to to add to our paper. 
on your uh, your JEL paper. So I'm going to talk about this paper uh, related to, to Remy's work. That's why I'm so interested in uh, in reading that JEL paper. Uh, because here, co-authored with uh, my colleagues from Fudan University, where I was on sabbatical, I guess it was two years ago now, uh, with Chang Ma and, and Sili Zhou on modern pandemics, recession and recovery. So it's a it's a it's a long academic paper. I'm going to try to hit the highlights and stay stay within in the in the, in the time limit here. So everything I say today will, will be coming from this paper, and I want to try and make it. Um, you know, some topical to a fairly uh, broad audience. So let me get right in and, and into the motivation of, again, of today's talk, just how big a macroeconomic shock is COVID-19 uh, rel relative to past pandemics. So let's just, let's just kind of start at the end here and get, get some numbers on that. So if we look at the IMF, Forecast, right. So, so what we what we're interested in doing in, in in comparing our academic paper that I'm that I'm talking about with what's going on today is trying to figure out what what's the COVID shock, the GDP growth, you know, for 2020 and, and 2021 when we can sort of get a good handle on that. And of course, 2020 is almost finished. So a lot of this is just data. So let's try to let's look at the IMS World Economic Outlook. Let's compare their forecast made in September, the most recent one, to the forecast that they made in January of this year. This gives us a good idea of the COVID shock to projected GDP growth uh, from from the IMF. So if we look at those numbers, and they're they're right there on the table. You know, the IMF had been predicting a world growth of around 3.3% in January of this year, that's now a, a projected to be minus 4.4%. And again, most of 2020 is done. So, so this is, is mostly data. Uh, the IMF has actually been writing up their forecast. At, at first, this, this forecast was, was much lower. So that gives us an idea that the, the COVID shock to GDP growth or world GDP growth is around seven and a half, you know, 7.7 .7 percentage points. Uh, and then you can see for 2021, the COVID shock uh, is about, you know, uh, 1.8, uh, again, from the perspective of, of the IMF, they've uh, originally were forecasting 3.4 percentage point growth. It's now up to 5.2. So, so kind of the, the, the COVID recovery shock, right, the bounce back uh, from a fairly deep recession is, you know, positive 1.8%. 1, 1 so we want to compare the, these numbers, kind of the, 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 the COVID shock, to the six past pandemics that we study in, in our paper. And, and again, the, the, the point of my talk is going to be to describe how we obtain these numbers. So, so um, when we look back at these six past pandemics and we kind of compare uh, severe country cases only, that's the, the third column in my table, uh, or, or we just take all cases put, put together, obviously COVID is a pretty severe case, we get numbers, uh, uh, you know, the, our, our shock to GDP growth is about three, minus three percentage points off of GDP growth. Again, minus 2.6 in the baseline, minus 3.5% uh, if we look at just the severe crises. With a standard error of about one, we can back out that the COVID shock, you know, COVID is about twice as bad or really even four standard deviations, if you, if you want to think of it that way, which I think is a bit more... Uh, uh, plausible way to think about it. COVID is about four standard deviations worse than the average past modern pandemic. By modern pandemic, I mean post World War II, not going as far back as Remy did in, in his studies. And, and in the lower part of the table, we, we look at these COVID shock projections for US GDP growth too, and we add the, the FOMC's uh, forecast as well. But I, I, won't, I won't dwell on on that. So um, again, just jumping right into the data that we use here, here, you know, here's a heat map of just how bad COVID 
19 is, right? We're now above 40, sorry, 54 million cases worldwide with COVID. And that compares to, you know, the first of the past pandemics that we look at, the 1968 flu, H1N1, which was worse, but still not nearly as bad as COVID. And you know Zika and, and Ebola, uh, we, we we look at it as well. Um, so again, just in terms of the raw data, we look at six total. I only showed you three of the the six past pandemics. Just again, looking at the raw data here, so everything's unconditional, not, nothing's being estimated. Here's the GDP growth distribution around these past pandemic. You know, for our entire sample of countries. So we've got around uh, 200 countries here, annual data. So lots of observations and a lot of our identification is coming off the cross section. And you can kind of see it in these four snapshots. So the upper left panel is just the distribution of GDP growth in all non-disease years of the sample, right? And so you can see that the mean is about uh, 3.8, percent that's the typical growth rate worldwide in non-disease years the red bar marks china way to the right of the of the gdp growth distribution of course so that one is uh what's china 8.29 percent uh, finland is in yellow sort of a randomly selected country and the u.s is in blue so let, let's now move clockwise in the upper right panel is the GDP growth rate distribution in the onset years of all crisis episodes. So all our past pandemics, remember COVID's not in here, all our past pandemic years, you can see that the distribution moves to the left as we would expect. There's a rather large drop in the GDP growth rate of some countries like Finland, where the Finland uh, growth rate went from 2.74% in non-disease years to minus 3% in these in the onset years uh, of those years where Finland was affected by one of these past pandemics. The U.S. growth rate drops by about uh, 2% as well, 1.3%, 1, 1 I guess it is. And you can see the world growth rate dropping, again, just unconditionally here, by about 2.4 percent, similar to the number I showed you in the table. China, as always, just unaffected. Look at China, it just grows like gangbusters no, no matter what. So continuing clockwise, you can see in the bottom right corner, the, on, the GDP growth rate distribution in the onset year of health crises, but for unaffected countries. So for those countries that did not get affected by the by the pandemic, what was the growth rate distribution? And you can see it looks a lot like the non-disease years. The U.S. bar is missing from the lower right panel because the U.S. was affected in all six past pandemic episodes. Okay, so you can see from the, and then if we go to the, to the bottom left, this is the bounce back year. There's a GDP growth rate distribution the year after the onset of the past pandemic for affected countries. So these are only the countries that were affected by the past pandemic. How did they bounce back? And you can see that this looks a lot like non-disease years. There, there's a, and in fact, it's even a more robust recovery that, that, than, the, than is implied by the distribution of growth rates in the non-disease years. So two lessons from this, just look at the raw data. Uh, Past pandemics had large effects on countries' growth rates, and bounce back was 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 pretty quick. So if we compare affected countries to non-affected countries, okay, which is the the right column, okay, and that's where most of our econometric identification is going to come from, as I'll explain in just a minute. You can see that past pandemics did put a big dent into affected countries' growth rates, but that bounce back. What, what was fairly quick. Okay, so what, what, what do we do in the paper, um, more broadly speaking? I already gave you the, the, the first bullet. I think there's really maybe three results here, kind of three things that I, ju I just want to uh, touch on uh, ra rather quickly here. 
The first is just to more formally estimate these macroeconomic outcomes in terms of GDP growth. Again, we're always going to be looking at comparing affected countries relative to unaffected countries. And we got three, three results here. We'll look at GDP, growth rate declines, kind of already showed you that. Do the same thing for unemployment increases. Unemployment increases are sizable and actually even more persistent, in case I don't get to it, uh, even more persistent than the GDP growth rate distributions. Uh, and that, that, those GDP growth declines are comparable to the effects that we've observed you know, in the literature from systemic banking crises. So some great work by uh, I, the IMF on, on this issue. What is the effect of banking crises? on GDP growth rates. There's some geographic uh, heterogeneity, disease episode heterogeneity. I, I probably won't get too much of that. Uh, but there's also important distributional effects. And I want to make sure this gets emphasized in my talk too. Uh, you know, the, these health crises are not just about macroeconomic aggregates. There are serious distributional consequences to pandemics. And, and we're seeing this with, with COVID. We saw it in past pandemics too. So we document that unemployment is worse for the less educated, worse for females than males. And there are sectoral effects too, that hardest hit were uh, in industrial sectors and the services sector, you know, if we compare that say to agriculture. Uh, a second result is on trade. International trade absolutely plummets. And the typical past pandemic had trade, trade declines that were on par with the U.S. trade collapse in 2008, 2009. Well, once again, much like we saw with GDP growth, trade rebounds very quickly. Within this result on international trade, we document important indirect effects on GDP growth working through trade networks. So that's kind of this second sub-bullet for bullet number two here. Right. So your GDP is going to be affected when your trading partner gets sick, even if you don't get sick. And we and we back out an estimate of that trade network effect. OK, this, of course, also means in terms of the rebound, when your trading partner recovers, your GDP is going to recover, even if you were unaffected by by the pandemic uh, uh, at, at the outset. Final result has to do with fiscal policy. Fiscal policy seems to take something off of the severity of these pandemics. We document that recovery and GDP growth is stronger for countries with larger initial government spending responses, especially expend expenditures on healthcare. So let me dive right into the details here. Most of our data comes from the World Bank, okay? Um, we've got a, a, a very large cross-section of countries, 210, going back to 1960. We've got around 300 country year health crisis observations. So with six pandemics, it's almost 50 countries uh, affected per pandemic. Okay. Um, let me dive talk a little bit about the methodology. Basically, we're gonna we in the paper we rely on three different methodologies: the so-called local projections estimator, which is just gonna allow us uh, to estimate the dynamic effects. I say on GDP growth and un unemployment. You can think of the left-hand side variable y here as being alternatively GDP growth, unemployment. OK, and this uh, D is the crisis dummy. We control for a whole bunch of things in this uh, 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 vector X, vector variables X. And we'll get to, to that on the next page. So so controlling for a whole bunch of things. What was the dynamic effect? And we're going to go out to five years. Our horizon H is up to five years. The dynamic effect of the typical pandemic, again, in terms of the effects on unemployment and GDP growth. <clears throat> So that, that's kind of for the pictures I'm going to show you. We also rely on panel OLS regressions, which are useful in their own right, especially in terms of looking at the uh, uh, breakdown by, uh, by disease episode itself and, and other ways of slicing the data. <clears throat> you might be concerned about endogeneity here. You, 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 rightfully, you rightfully would be, you know, uh, isn't there a, a relationship between health 
that health care expenditures and, and GDP growth isn't there, the relationship between GDP growth and the severity of you know, the outbreak of the disease possibly. So we're gonna, we, we, we run a simple uh, system of equations that's seemingly unrelated regressions, which allows for this feedback between say healthcare expenditures and GDP growth, uh, the probability of a disease outbreak and health expenditures, probability of a disease episode outbreak and GDP growth. Just, just like you would want to in any sort of macro application here. So here's our local projections. I, again, no, no time to go into the details. It's a very well-known estimator, uh, again, for looking at the dynamic effects of shocks. Okay, We control for a whole bunch of things in, in, in X here, uh, trade to GDP ratios, population, GDP per capita, a recession dummy, decade dummies, country fixed effects, banking crises dummies. So, with a whole bunch of controls, let's get at, at pictures and tables here. I'll just run through these uh, uh, relatively quickly. You kind of know the, the, the results already. Um, so you can see that from this dynamic estimator, what I said at the outset, GDP growth uh, declines for affected countries relative to unaffected countries are, are large between, you know, two, two and a half, three and a half, percentage points off of GDP growth in the onset year with a fairly quick bounce back. But notice if we look kind of three, four or five years out, and you just sort of add things up a little bit here, because these are growth rates, the level of GDP growth is not back to the pre-crisis trend even after five years. So these effects are fairly persistent. And they're about as large, although with a different dynamic uh, uh, effect, <clears throat> just about as large as banking crises. So, so these are uh, local projections, impulse responses we estimated ourselves on a sample of banking crises. Here's the equivalent picture for unemployment rate. You see even more persistence in unemployment. It rises by nearly a full percentage point, again, in the typical affected country relative to unaffected countries. And that persistence is, is even a bit larger than the persistence in GDP growth. You can see the distributional consequences here. For those classified by the World Bank as having only a basic education or an intermediate education, the scales are the same here across the, the three pictures, uh, the effects on unemployment are a lot more severe and for those with an advanced education by gender, female, especially females with basic education, the, the effects on unemployment are larger and more persistent. Sectoral breakdown, industry sector, services sector, uh, harder hit, although the bounce back is pretty fast in the service sector. Agriculture, not highly affected at all. Here are some panel regressions where we're able to, again, control for some other things. Uh, look at what happens when we estimate the model without the H1N1 episode in it, that, that being the largest. Uh, when we control for forecasts, so the second row of this uh, table adds a consensus forecast for GDP growth into the regression. We have the data on that for relatively small number of countries and only back to 1990. But you can see that the results are, are fairly robust. World GDP growth declines of around two and a half percentage points to three percentage points off. Okay, individual crises separated, H1N1 is by far the worst, but the others were significant too. Ebola, MERS, SARS, uh, SARS, I guess, not so statistically significant, uh, but Zika significant as well. So individual countries are separated. We also look at by severity. So what if we focus only on those crises, uh, episodes, country year episodes where the mortality rate was high or the cases per population rate was high. So that's kind of where you saw um, this number of about three and a half percent on the first table, these high mortality rate episodes were even more, had even larger uh, uh, negative effects on GDP growth as, as you would as, uh, expect. 
seemingly unrelated regressions, again, allowing some feedback here, the, uh, the, the results tend to, tend to be robust. So, so the, some of this is in the direction of how many ways can I say minus 2.4% to minus 3.5%, uh, here they all are. Geographic heterogeneity, let's skip some of that and move right on to the second result, looking at trade network effect. So we do, we do a couple things with trade network here. So the, the heat map on the left, or the, these heat maps depict, you know, uh, basically the, the following, you know, how much do you as an individual country trade with other countries and multiplied by how badly that country was affected by a particular episode? Okay, so, so that's how we're gonna back out this trade network effect. So even if a bunch of other countries were severely affected by the pandemic, if you don't trade much with them, it's not likely to affect your GDP growth. Okay, so, so the, um, the, the panel on the right is decomposing the overall GDP growth rate effect of pandemics, past pandemics, into a direct effect, that's the blue, and the indirect effect that works through trade networks. So, so again, even if you didn't get hit by the health crisis, if a bunch of your important trading partners did, that's this indirect effect. It might look small, but it's actually a half a percentage point of GDP growth. So it's fairly large, but you can see that recovery is fast as well. The panel on the left is just putting trade growth on the left-hand side of that um, local projections estimator. So you can see trade declines. This is the total trade, exports plus imports, by nearly 20%. In, in the onset year, but, but bounces back fairly quickly. And again, in no small part due to trade network effects. Uh, fiscal policy makes a difference. I think this should be the last, uh, the last slide that I have here. Fiscal policy makes a difference in recoveries. What we do is we look at governments, uh, you know, countries, uh, government expenditures, including uh, overall expenditures and what I'm showing here, expenditures on healthcare. Again, this is just data from the World Bank. We compute the cross crises average spending between year zero, the, the onset year of the crisis, and the year before. Okay, so what was healthcare spending in the onset year of the crisis compared to spending on healthcare the year before the crisis hit, deflated by GDP in the year before? The crisis hit. And we compare the high expenditure response countries, the 75th percentile and above, to the low expenditure response countries, the 25th percentile and below. You can see that in the onset year, there's not much of a difference, right? Again, the scales are the same here, basically the same. Okay? The, the impact of the crisis was about the same, but what's different? What's different is year one. Okay, that, that recovery is, is a lot more robust for countries whose fisc immediate fiscal policy response was larger. Okay, so just, just to wrap up here, let me spend a, just a minute or so on this and, and, and then uh, turn it over. Our estimates kind of imply a, a Nike swoosh recovery, if you will. So it, it's not a, a sharp V recovery. There is quick bounce back. Um, you know, again, from our past crisis episodes, but, you know, there's also persistence in the effects of these past crises. And, and that these estimates in our paper are likely very much a lower bound for COVID. And that's kind of the table I started off with, my, my very first slide, saying, look, COVID is like a four standard deviations worse than the average past pandemic. Why? I think we all kind of know now COVID is much more widespread. You saw that from my heat maps. I think COVID it may have a higher kill rate. We, we don't really know that just yet. Uh, this is a world in which global value chains are now much bigger. These unprecedented travel bans, social distancing, lockdowns. Um, uh, we also see that fiscal policy helps, but fiscal space now is lower than in 2009. Countries are doing all they can well, maybe all they can. I'm not so sure that's true in the U.S. these days. Uh, 
But fiscal space is actually much lower than it was, say, in 2009. A second important result, open trade linkages benefit macroeconomic recovery. There's no doubt about that. We saw that uh, very robustly in these past pandemic episodes. But one wonders, is globalization dead? I mean, countries in the West, surely the U.S., uh, are really quite wary about being so reliant on imports uh, or China uh, for high priority goods. And one wonders about the lasting impact of that, of that wariness. We've also observed the resumption of just pervasive China bashing in the West. And I have a paper with my Fed colleague, Xun Bo, uh, where we're looking at news, we've constructed news-based indices of US-China hostility. And we see how they peak uh, at election time, especially years of a presidential election where both Democrats and Republicans try to compete to bash China. Right? This was historic. This was not, not just Trump, uh, it was it was Obama too, uh, Biden uh, to be be tough on China. Even even Bernie Sanders tough on China. Who can compete to be tougher on China? And and this China bashing we we see at almost historic levels uh, from our newspaper searches. And then the final thing to say is there are just very important distributional consequences of, of health crises. The less educated suffer larger and more persistent spells in unemployment. Uh, less educated females suffer the most. So maybe this COVID recovery, it, it could well be K-shaped in terms of factoring in these distributions. But importantly enough, recovery policies help distribution. It, it helps in terms of uh, you know, di distribution uh, outcomes, not only aggregate outcomes. So for that, I, I, I'll stop. I, I thank you for the time and, and look forward to further discussion if, if there's time for that. Thank you, John. Um, sorry for sending all the reminders about the time. I saw that you had 39 slides, so I was kind of worried, but it's great that you finished at 28. <laughs> oh, no, no worries. I, I didn't even see any of the reminders. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, all right. great then. <laughs> Okay, Michael, it's your turn. It's uh, 10, 10, so likewise, you have 25 minutes. Thank you. Um, and uh, uh, thank everyone for organizing this uh, very interesting uh, event. And I have to uh, uh, thank in particular, you know, John for uh, his uh, fantastic presentation. Actually, I'm going to talk about a lot of the points that he made in his presentation uh, using China as a case study. And uh, my approach is going to be much less academic than his. Um, so uh, I'm going to uh, share my observations about uh, the Chinese economy with you. Um, and in particular, I'm going to talk about two things. One is uh, uh, economic losses caused by this pandemic. And the second thing is about uh, economic recovery we see in China uh, after the pandemic was uh, contained. Um, so here are the three things uh, I'm going to go through. Uh, the first thing is uh, how hard was uh, China hit by the pandemic and how fast has uh, China been recovering? So the conventional way of looking at these questions uh, uh, is just to use uh, official statistics like GDP. Um, but when it comes to China's official statistics, uh, uh, you know, people, some people would like to question its reliability and accuracy. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, first uh, present data from China's uh, private sector, and then I'm going to complement uh, uh, this with the China's official statistics. Um, so uh, there are a few advantages of uh, using data from the private sector. Uh, the first one is uh, it's uh, transparency. We know, you know where they come from and uh, what they are suggesting. And the second thing is um, uh, the private sector data tends to be at the more disaggregate levels than uh, official statistics. Uh, so if you really want to understand kind of uh, distributional consequences as uh, John was talking about, then you know, uh, private sector data uh, it offers, uh, offers let's say, alternative way to understand these issues. And uh, often, you know, uh, private sector data uh, comes in a more timely manner than uh, official statistics, uh, uh, since uh, we typically have to wait for uh, 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 one year or so uh, for the release of the official statistics. Uh, but the downside is also obvious. Uh, uh, private sector data 
typically only focuses on uh, certain parts of, uh, of of the economy, and therefore uh, uh, these data uh, sources uh, tend to uh, provide a much less holistic view about uh, the, the economy. Uh, but uh, the good news is, uh, regardless of uh, uh, which data uh, source we're using, the message seems to be pretty consistent. When it comes to uh, economic recovery, uh, we see uh, uh, all data sources suggest a pretty quick and uh, a strong recovery in China after the pandemic was uh, was was contained. Um, and there are a little bit of inconsistency between the private sector data and the official statistics about you know how big. The economic losses caused by uh, the pandemic, in particular, uh, in the service industries. Uh, I will elaborate this uh, later. Um, and then the, the second thing I'm going to talk about is, uh, uh, so as I said, it's related to uh, John's uh, point about the uh, distributive consequences. So I'm going to show you uh, a regional, uh, sectorial, and firm heterogeneity. Um, what we found is. Uh, um, when it comes to uh, recovery, uh, it seems that the recovery uh, has been pretty strong everywhere in China. In most uh, cities in China, you see uh, economy uh, has been bouncing back. Um, but there are a lot of uh, differences across uh, uh, firms and across industries. And what we found is manufacturing has been, the recovery in manufacturing has been uh, substantially stronger than the recovery in service industries. And there are also a lot of uh, heterogeneity within the service industries. Some uh, uh, industries have been uh, picking up very rapidly, as some seems to be affected uh, uh, a lot worse than the average. And we also see um, uh, some uh, important differences between uh, large firms and small firms. Uh, large firms, uh, small firms seem to be uh, hit much harder than uh, large firms, and their recovery also seem to be uh, weaker than uh, large firms. Um, I guess the pattern uh, uh, is more or less the same uh, across countries after you know, uh, the pandemic is controlled. Uh, but this uh, heterogeneity between large and small firms in China has a particular meaning because it's related to uh, uh, state sector and the private sector. State firms tend to be larger than uh, private firms. And there are many other important differences between state and private firms. So uh, if state firms are recovering faster than uh, private firms, it has some interesting implications for, for the longer term uh, 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 in China. So the last thing, which is, uh, which is the most uh, academic part in my presentation, and I'm going to show you how to use a, a trade model uh, uh, to estimate or impute uh, COVID shocks. So here, COVID shocks, uh, 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 includes uh, uh, both, you know, the severity of uh, the disease and also uh, policy and individual responses. Um, and uh, using uh, the advantage of using a trade model is so we can not just uh, impute uh, COVID shocks, but we can also assess the welfare consequences of uh, of these shocks. So once again, it's just echoing what the John uh, has pointed out. Um, once you're thinking about uh, uh, trade uh, linkages, then even if uh, a COVID shock is just confined to a, a specific locality, it will sp spill over to uh, other regions through uh, trade connections. So it's very important to, to take into account the spill over and have a more complete measure about the uh, uh, economic losses uh, of uh, economic losses of, uh, of COVID shock. Okay. So the first part is uh, is about, basically about measurement. Um, so we have uh, four lines uh, uh, in this figure. Let's first look at the, the two thick lines. Uh, so uh, the solid thick line is a new uh, uh, daily COVID cases in China, and the dotted line is uh, is the daily new cases uh, from the Hubei province alone. Uh, so the epicenter of China's uh, uh, epi epidemic uh, 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 is uh, is the capital city of Hubei province, which is Wuhan. You can see most of the uh, new cases are actually coming from uh, that province. Uh, again, there there are some questions about uh, uh, the accuracy of the of the new cases uh, uh, in China. Um, for uh, research purposes, uh, uh, what we care most is. Uh, um, 
how informative is uh, this official uh, uh, new cases um, about the severity of, of the pandemic uh, in China? Uh, so there is evidence uh, saying, you know, uh, uh, the number of new cases uh, 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 across the cities uh, seems to be highly correlated with uh, uh, the number of trips uh, 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 leaving Wuhan uh, uh, the epicenter of the pandemic in China before uh, the city was locked down. So this is an evidence of saying that, you know, uh, the number of new cases, uh, even if you look at the official uh, numbers, the numbers seem to be uh, uh, closely correlated uh, with the local severity of the pandemic. Uh, so in a way, uh, these uh, official uh, numbers uh, are informative about the severity of the pandemic across cities and over time. So you can see uh, the number of new cases uh, uh, basically disappeared after uh, two or three months uh, uh, when Wuhan was uh, was uh, was locked down. And uh, the other two lines in this figure, one is uh, uh, the thin but the solid line, tells us uh, uh, the aggregate city to city truck flows. So this is daily uh, city to city uh, truck flows at the aggregate level. And the data is from uh, one of the uh, largest uh, logistical companies in, in China. Uh, so the company basically keeps track of uh, uh, millions of heavy trucks uh, that are shipping goods uh, 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 across the cities. So we know, you know uh, what are the uh, departure cities, uh, what are the arriving cities, so which uh, heavy truck uh, was active. Uh, uh, so this allows us to come up with this kind of uh, trade network data at the very high frequency. Um, what you can see here is, uh, well, uh, uh, the economic losses uh, seem to be very big uh, after Wuhan was locked down. Um, at the aggregate level, uh, the number of uh, truck flows uh, uh, declined by almost like half. And if you look at uh, the dotted line, this is uh, the number of uh, uh, truck flows uh, uh, in Hubei uh, province. Then the decline was even more dramatic, almost like uh, eighty percent or ninety percent of uh, truck flows were gone. Uh, 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 but after two or three months, you can see, you know, uh, even in Hubei province, uh, the truck flows uh, just went back to a normal level. So the recovery was was very very quick. Um, and this figure uh, tells us the latest development. So you can see, uh, 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 starting from June, uh, you can actually see a, a growing trend of uh, truck flows in China. So uh, uh, forget about this uh, uh, big trough. Uh, that was primarily because of uh, seven day national holidays in, in China. Uh, but uh, uh, if you take out this trough, you, you can see a pretty steady uh, growth trend uh, after the summer. So that suggests, uh, once again, a pretty strong uh, recovery. And you can also use uh, uh, other sources. For instance, uh, um, we can use uh, uh, online job posts uh, from uh, uh, several major online uh, job platforms. So employment data quality is not high in China. Uh, uh, so that's why when we want to understand the employment situation, um, we better use online job posts. So here we collect the data from three major online uh, job platforms uh, in China. Uh, what you can see here is more or less uh, similar to uh, what the, the truck flow uh, data is suggesting. Uh, although you know the labor market's uh, responses uh, on average appear to be a bit uh, slower than you know truck flows. Uh, uh, in uh, February and March, uh, you see uh, a big decline in the total number of online job posts. So here, uh, the black line is the number of uh, total jobs uh, posted online last year, and uh, a red solid line is this year's number. But once again, you can see the number is picking up, and uh, in the summertime, you can see a big boom in the number of uh, online job posts. Okay. Um, now let's come back to uh, the official statistics. Um, the Official statistics for the first quarter, so GDP uh, uh, dropped by 7%. Uh, there was a bigger drop in the secondary industry, uh, which basically uh, consists of the manufacturing and uh, construction. 
And here is uh, is uh, is the biggest inconsistency between uh, the official statistics and uh, private sector data. That is uh, uh, the GDP decline in the tertiary industry, in the service industries. Uh, the official statistics suggest that actually a uh, uh, milder decline uh, in economic activities in services, uh, which is just 5%, uh, uh, much less severe than the decline in secondary uh, industry GDP. But, you know, using uh, uh, different data sources, uh, some of the data sources I will show you later, uh, 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 they actually suggest a more severe decline in uh, GDP in service industries. Uh, and why, you know, uh, we see uh, such a, a significant inconsistency between the official statistics and private sector data, there could be uh, two reasons. One is, uh, 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 under reporting of uh, economic losses uh, in the official statistics. Um, I think this is uh, understandable just because, uh, you know, uh, there's some kind of the dramatic structural adjustments in the service sector. And, you know, measuring uh, service sector's output is, is not easy. It's harder than measuring that added in manufacturing. And in this particular time where, you know, uh, 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 there are quite a bit of uh, structural adjustments, then measurement of output uh, in service industries is, became uh, much harder. Another reason for the inconsistency is related to this uh, uh, structural adjustment. Uh, for instance, you can you can look at the, the electricity growth uh, uh, in industrial in the secondary industry and in uh, uh, tertiary industry in China. The left uh, panel is about uh, electricity growth in secondary industry. And the right panel is about the electricity growth, consumption growth in tertiary industry. The two lines in each panel, uh, the blue line is, uh, is, uh, is last year's monthly growth, and the red line is this year's monthly growth. Even using official statistics, and you can clearly see a uh, much more dramatic decline in electricity consumption growth in the tertiary uh, industry. But when, why, you know, uh, the official GDP decline was uh, less dramatic in uh, that industry, it could be the case that once again, it's related to structural adjustments in service industries. Some uh, industries uh, may appear to be uh, uh, more active, uh, and these industries just happen to be less uh, uh, energy intensive. So uh, there are uh, uh, several uh, uh, potential explanations why we see this major inconsistency between uh, private sector data and the official statistics. Um, so another interesting thing uh, uh, is um, the recent uh, economic recovery in China uh, seems to be driven by investment. So um, is this a surprising news? Uh, let me first give you some uh, background information. So when we, uh, for many people, when, when you start to think about, uh, you know, what are the driving forces for China's economic growth, uh, uh, many of us may actually uh, 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 think of investment as, as uh, the biggest uh, uh, driving force. Uh, it was true uh, for China's growth uh, about a decade ago, but in recent years, uh, consumption growth actually becomes uh, uh, stronger than uh, investment growth. Uh, as you can see, once again, from, this, uh, 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 from these two panels, the left panel is about uh, consumption growth, which is measured by retail uh, sales. And the, the right panel is about uh, investment growth. There are a lot of issues about uh, this investment data, uh, but the uh, National Bureau of Statistics of China have made a lot of efforts uh, in correcting this uh, statistics. Uh, so in recent years, so when you compare these two panels, uh, uh, what you find is uh, last year, the consumption growth was uh, stronger than investment growth. Uh, uh, and last year's numbers are plotted by the blue line. But if you look at this year's number, and the pattern uh, actually has been reversed, and you find a much stronger investment growth uh, than consumption growth. And uh, using the latest monthly uh, data, the investment growth uh, uh, was about uh, uh, seven to eight percent. This is on, uh, this is this is year on year growth rate. If you look at consumption growth, it's just like two or three percent. Okay. Um, and this uh, investment-driven uh, growth, I think, to to a large extent, is related to uh, macroeconomic policies. 
uh, I don't want to uh, talk too much about that because I don't think this is particularly uh, uh, interesting. Um, uh, the government has been using uh, expansionary monetary and uh, fiscal policies. Uh, uh, you see uh, more or less the same thing uh, in many other countries. Um, and but one thing I want, would like to uh, highlight is uh, those uh, 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 expansionary policies appear to be less dramatic than what the Chinese government uh, used uh, to deal with uh, uh, the financial crisis uh, in uh, about a decade ago. Uh, and a, another major difference is a lot of things now are becoming a lot more transparent. And previously, when uh, uh, they launched what they called, you know, four trillion fiscal stimulus package a decade ago, uh, a lot of uh, uh, expenditures uh, were financed through uh, opaque local uh, government financing vehicles. Uh, and but now, when they uh, do this uh, uh, expansionary fiscal policies, uh, they just uh, convert those uh, 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 local financing vehicles into more transparent. Uh, uh, borrowing instruments, just like they just issue uh, local government bonds to raise funds uh, for uh, infrastructure investment, for, for example. Let me see actually how much time do I have? Oh, I'm running out of time. So, uh, no, yes, yeah, seven minutes. Seven minutes. Yeah, I still have two parts. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. So, let me just be quick on uh, this. Uh, uh, regional, uh, sectorial, and firm uh, heterogeneity. So the first thing is about, uh, um, say, let's uh, see um, uh, economic losses caused by the pandemic across the cities. So once again, we're using uh, truck flow data. So the left panel uh, shows uh, uh, the decline in uh, truck flows across the cities. So when you see uh, red colors, it means uh, truck flow is declining, and when you see blue, uh, it means that truck flows uh, uh, are increasing. Uh, in the first quarter, not surprisingly, most cities experienced a pretty dramatic decline in truck flows. Uh, but if you look at the, the right panel, uh, then you find uh, 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 truck flows picking up uh, uh, in most cities. Um, so uh, this is a year-on-year -year, uh, change, so that means uh, uh, the recovery uh, was uh, was pretty uh, quick. And another way to, to look at uh, uh, economic losses uh, uh, is to use uh, business registration information. Uh, China has a total of uh, uh, 40 million firms registered, many new firms are registered uh, every year. So we can look at uh, uh, the growth of number of new firms registered uh, in each quarter. Uh, once again, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but just to know the left panel uh, shows, you know, uh, in the first quarter, there is a big decline in uh, 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 the number of the newly registered firms. But once again, you know, the bounce back uh, was uh, very strong and quick in the second quarter. In most cities, uh, you see uh, uh, pretty high uh, growth in the number of the newly registered firms. Um, but if you look at the sectorial uh, differences, uh, then uh, uh, you find uh, a lot more heterogeneity is there. Um, so the left panel tells us uh, the growth of number of newly registered firms across uh, 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 one digit industry uh, uh, last year. So I want to highlight two industries, uh, both in the service sector. Uh, uh, the first industry is education. So education has been a, a star industry uh, with uh, a spectacular growth rate. So you can see uh, uh, the number of newly registered firms uh, last year was more than doubled. Another industry is hotels and catering, which also uh, experienced a very strong growth over the past few years. But uh, uh, these two industries uh, seem to be hit uh, uh, hardest by uh, the pandemic, according to the number of uh, newly registered firms, uh, uh, the numbers uh, in both industries uh, declined very dramatically in the first quarter. Um, and uh, uh, it seems that uh, uh, none of them uh, managed to uh, uh, recover uh, in the second quarter. Uh, the growth rate uh, was essentially zero. 
the education uh, sector uh, started to pick up uh, in the third quarter, but hotels and catering still uh, experienced no growth. Okay. So that suggests that there's some kind of uh, uh, significant structural uh, adjustments going on, and this adjustment could be uh, uh, long lasting. Um, the last thing about uh, heterogeneity or distributive consequences is uh, once again using online uh, job data uh, to look at uh, uh, if uh, uh, this uh, pandemic has caused different effects uh, on uh, firms with different size. Um, what we are plotting here is we first, first of all, we put firms uh, uh, into uh, 10 groups uh, by their uh, registered capital last year. So in the test group, uh, these are the firms with uh, uh, the largest uh, registered capital. And you see two bars. The blue bar is for the number of uh, job posts last year, and the red bar is for the number uh, this year. Uh, uh, actually, we're using uh, the first quarter data uh, for this figure. And we see two things, basically. The first is, of course, uh, 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 regardless of uh, firm size, uh, the number of the job posts just declined uh, a lot in the first quarter. But the second message is more important. And you find that the decline is uh, uh, less severe for large firms. Um, and this uh, uh, solid line uh, plots uh, uh, the ratio of the first quarter uh, uh, number of uh, uh, job posts uh, divided by the number of job posts uh, 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 in the first quarter last year. And you can see the line is uh, increasing uh, in firm size, uh, indicating you know, uh, uh, a big uh, symmetry uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, effects on uh, firm employment uh, uh, across the firm size. And this is important for uh, uh, China because uh, a lot of the large firms are actually state owned enterprises, uh, uh, which have uh, uh, privileged uh, uh, access to cheap credit and many of these state-owned enterprises are also associated with lower productivity. So that means, uh, you know, this uh, COVID shock may actually worsen uh, the misallocation uh, in China, which has uh, uh, long-term uh, implication on China's productivity growth. Uh, let me just uh, skip that part. Uh, uh, one uh, uh, thing I would like to uh, mention is uh, uh, the distributive uh, consequences uh, on uh, exporters and non-exporters. So last year, uh, last year was a very bad year for uh, China's exports, uh, primarily because of the uh, U.S.-China uh, trade war. Uh, export growth was uh, basically zero for most of the months, uh, compared to kind of two-digit growth uh, uh, two years ago. Uh, but interestingly, um, if you compare exporters uh, 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 job posts uh, with the non-exporters uh, job posts, and you don't find uh, significant differences. And if anything, in more recent months, uh, you find that uh, uh, exporters uh, are putting more uh, online job posts uh, than non-exporters. Okay, so uh, I guess I don't have much time. Let me just be very quick on the last part. So, uh, um, what we're doing here is, uh, uh, first of all, we try to impute uh, uh, COVID shocks uh, from uh, uh, daily city-to-city uh, -city, uh, truck flow data. So the idea is uh, we try to identify uh, uh, COVID shocks, which, uh, which, which are broadly defined. They include the severity of the disease, and it also includes uh, 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 economic impact caused by uh, preventive uh, measures like uh, lockdown policy. Um, and our estimated COVID shocks uh, appear to be highly correlated with the uh, 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 number of cases across cities. However, the number of cases only account for a small proportion of uh, COVID shocks we identified, indicating that uh, you know lockdown policies or containment measures account for about 70%, 80% of uh, COVID shocks uh, uh, in China. And those uh, black triangles are basically COVID shocks for uh, Hubei province. And you can see uh, uh, the measure of uh, 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 containment policies uh, uh, appears to be 
uh, uh, more dramatic in Hubei provinces uh, uh, compared to the average level in the other places, uh, even after controlling for uh, uh, COVID cases. Um, so one last thing I want to uh, talk about is uh, um, we can we can basically uh, 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 come up with uh, some numbers about uh, how big the economy losses will be if you implement lockdown policy, uh, like uh, what the uh, Chinese government uh, uh, did to Wuhan. Uh, um, so the idea is, uh, say, uh, when the policymakers want to understand uh, uh, how big the economic losses will be caused by Wuhan-style uh, lockdown, especially uh, if you want to take into account the spillovers of the lockdown policy because of trade linkage, then this exercise will share uh, some lights uh, on the overall effects, including uh, uh, the spillovers because of the trade linkage. And one number that we uh, come up with is uh, if uh, 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 all the cities uh, adopt Wuhan-style lockdown, then the first quarter uh, uh, GDP in China will be cut by uh, almost like half. And uh, 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 if we think about the Wuhan's lockdown and uh, how big economic losses at the aggregate level will be caused by uh, Wuhan lockdown, then uh, the overall GDP in China, according to our estimate, will be cut by 2%, which is also a significant number. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to stop here. I basically say, said what I want to say. Thanks a lot. Sorry for running out. Um, and I'd like to remind uh, all the attendees that you can submit questions to either in the chat box or the Q&A box. Um, I already have a few questions I'm going to read on your behalf. Um, I have, we have two questions for you, Michael, and then a uh, more general question maybe for John. Um, so the question for Mike, my, um, for Michael is like, about the electricity consumption data. Is it official data from the government or from private sector companies? So how well does it measure, like, really measure like economic activity? So I, uh, missed the first part of the question. So the question is about the electricity data or about the truck flow data? No, the electricity data. Uh, is this okay. electricity data official data that is provided by the government or like the, the state governments? Or is it from private electricity companies like in the US? Public, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's from uh, official, uh, uh, it's, it's from official sources. Um, so the interesting thing about this uh, uh, data is uh, um, um, you can you can see a stable relationship between uh, GDP growth and uh, electricity consumption growth in many periods, but there are also periods in which uh, you know the two numbers uh, 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 deviate from each other. Um, so that uh, leads to the question. Uh, in those uh, periods when the two numbers are different, uh, how should we think of uh, uh, you know, the official uh, GDP statistics? Uh, and in uh, this particular uh, uh, period of time, I think I'm just uh, speculating here. Uh, uh, much of the inconsistency, I think, is coming from uh, this kind of structural adjustment uh, uh, I was talking about. Um, uh, so once you once the economy experienced a pretty dramatic uh, structural adjustments, that would be very difficult for uh, uh, the government to come up with uh, accurate estimate of uh, GDP. Very good. Uh, another question from the chat is: um, People were very are very interested in these results on um, state-owned enterprise versus private companies. Uh, do you see stronger recovery effect for the SOEs or for private companies? And are they in fact different by sector? And I had a related question is that in the US, like uh, we don't have SOEs as much. I mean, some companies receive public subsidies. So does it mean that we expect different recovery effects in China versus the US because of the more the importance of SOEs in China? Yeah, so um, it's related to a kind of broader uh, question. Um, why uh, China uh, often experienced a quicker recovery uh, than you know uh, Western economies? 
So last time, the last time we, we saw this is, uh, is uh, uh, after China introduced the uh, 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 what they call you know four trillion uh, fiscal fiscal stimulus package. Uh, you see a very strong economic recovery, uh, much faster than uh, what you see in the U.S. in European countries. So one uh, important instrument that China had. Uh, but U.S. and uh, uh, other Western major economies uh, do not have is, is the state sector. So they can basically uh, inject liquidity directly uh, from, you know, the state-owned banks uh, to state-owned enterprises. Um, so uh, that is uh, kind of a unique uh, part of, uh, of Chinese economy. But, you know, uh, that thing comes at a huge cost. Uh, because uh, uh, if you think about China as an economy with the two sectors, one sector is uh, closer to, to the state, but, you know, this uh, state sector is also less productive. Uh, so uh, the short run game is very uh, obvious. That is, uh, it helps uh, the economy to bounce back uh, more quickly, but the more longer term consequence will be, you know, you are basically putting too much resources to a less productive sector. And that uh, uh, will cause uh, uh, productivity loss uh, in the long run. And actually, what we have learned from the past uh, experiences uh, after the implementation of this uh, four trillion uh, uh, stimulus package, uh, you see the productivity growth uh, at the aggregate level in China has been slowing down. So uh, 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 one uh, explanation to this is just worsened uh, allocative efficiency between the state sector and the private sector. Uh, I think the Chinese government has uh, uh, learned a lesson from the past experiences. So this time, I think they are uh, more cautious in helping uh, the state sector. Uh, so, um, yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, I have myself a question on your uh, study. Um, and you talk about investment driven recovery and I thought this was very interesting. And one of the themes that the World Bank these days is like, how can we rebuild better? Uh, in a post-COVID world, and um, there are a lot of studies um, showing how, how large fires, uh, city fires, or earthquakes have led to destructions in the short term, but it, eventually people are able to rebuild, rebuild better. And what we're seeing with a lot of, 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 I don't know, like shops and companies are making a lot of investments right now because first they have a time, you don't have customers in the restaurant, and at the same time you have low interest rates. So I don't know what the you know, monetary policy and interest rate policy in, in China, like, does it mean that companies are making a lot of investment or when the economy reopens again? Um, so do you think that you're going to have long, long run growth coming from that in China? Uh, this is a very interesting question. Uh, on the one hand, I think um, uh, seeing this uh, higher uh, investment growth uh, is uh, is healthy uh, uh, in the short run. Why? The reason is very simple. Uh, you see uh, a much higher saving rate uh, 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 as a, as a consequence of this pandemic. A uh, lot of consumption opportunities are gone. The people are forced to save more. Uh, so at the aggregate level, it's kind of healthy to see uh, a, a higher investment rate. Otherwise, you know, uh, where are you going to put uh, this uh, saving? Uh, as long as the uh, capital returns uh, uh, are above zero, then, you know, higher uh, investment rate seems to be good. Um, but on the other hand, uh, once again, it's related to uh, 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 the previous question. Um, what matters in the long run uh, is uh, this allocative efficiency of uh, investment. Suppose uh, a lot of investments are actually made by the uh, state and a lot of money uh, used to build bridges and roads uh, in the middle of nowhere. Uh, then, you know, uh, clearly the long-term consequences will look uh, uh, less promising. So one, I think one uh, 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 project I'm working on is just to look at the, uh, related to your work actually, uh, returns to infrastructure investment in, in China. And you, what you find is that using the same uh, uh, truck flow data, what we find is that 70% uh, or 90%, 70 to 80% of Chinese roads are not congested. So suppose you are expanding road network and you know, uh, putting a lot of investments on those uh, uncongested uh, uh, parts, 
then you can imagine the returns will be low. Um, of course, in the past, that was not a big question because China used to have very fast economic growth. So uh, probably after five years, after 10 years, of those empty roads will be congested. But the question here is uh, in the next five to, uh, to 10 years, uh, how high uh, the overall economic growth will be. Uh, so I think, you know, uh, in the short run, it's a good idea. But then uh, 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 how effective this uh, investment will be on the long term growth really depends on the allocated efficiency of this investment. Oh, it's perfect. I'm going to ask a lot of questions to John now. Um, so let me start with that question. Uh, all right. So someone is asking what roles have real estate industries played in a recovery? Uh, what's very interesting is that despite the economic crisis, we see like urban markets are really booming. Uh, there are, you know, prices are going up, for example, in DC region. Um, to what extent this is coming from the fact that people cannot invest, say, in, in other sectors, so they have to invest in real estate industry. And at the same time, myself, I want to ask if with a low interest rate, uh, it makes sense to also, you know, buy more housing. Um, so do, 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 to what extent the recovery that you see in the data is like, uh, a real recovery or just like housing price appreciation? Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's an excellent question. It, it's not one that we actually look, looked at because of data limitations, but I think it's uh, it's probably, you know, important now, uh, much different now from past episodes is that inter interest rates are, are, are essentially zero. So I, I, I wouldn't say that this played a big role in our in our past uh, episodes that that we took our estimates from, but probably is happening now. But you know, to what extent that's monetary policy, um, you know, re remains to be seen. Uh, I have a related question about the. This is from also from the chat. Uh, someone was very interested in your graph on high fiscal spending recovery versus low fiscal spending recovery. Mm -hmm. um, and someone says that it seems there's an overshooting of low fiscal spending recovery in the long term. And how do you interpret it? And is it a is there an endogeneity problem? So I don't remember the graph exactly. Um, right. Feel free right. to share the graph if you want to, or you just answer the question. No, it's 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 a good point. And as you might have noticed from our from my presentation, I, I didn't say very much about years five, four, and even three, really, uh, in part because these past pandemic episodes run into each other. So, so a lot of these happened in the, in the, in the, 20, you know, the early 2000s, the fir first decade of the 2000s. So you, know, you don't really want to make, and, and we don't in the paper, and, and I didn't in my talk, don't want to make much of years three, three four, and five. So anything having to do with overshooting, I, I would be really hesitant to, to talk about. Uh, the impact year and the recovery year, I think there are a lot of important lessons from that, including especially the fiscal policy lessons. But, but beyond that, it's not only an endogeneity that the question specified. I think we take care of that in our seemingly unrelated regressions framework, but it's really more the fact that identification is tricky because these episodes are, these pandemic episodes run into each other. Beyond Great. Uh, another question for you from the chat. Um, so consumer durables purchases, uh, for example, like how many vehicles people buy can be a good indicator of consumption recovery. Uh, do you use some, can you use some of these data as well? Uh, in your analysis, so you think GDP data is enough. And that's also if, Michael, you want to say something about, like, you know, whether people are buying cars in China or not as, as a measure of recovery, um, that would be interesting. Yeah, let, let me go quickly and then pass it along to Michael because he has much better data than, than, than we do. So we, we tried to get as much, you know, sectoral breakdown data as we could from these, uh, from the WDI, the World De Development Indicators from the World Bank. And that's a great data set. And they actually do have a decent amount of sectoral breakdown, you know, gender breakdown, geographic breakdown. It, it, it's, it's as best as you're going to get. But 
we, we don't have what, what, what Michael does or any kind of survey data would have. So we, we couldn't do much on that, but I'm interested to hear what Michael says. Okay, so uh, in terms of durable goods uh, consumption, um, so one thing I can say about uh, is uh, online sales, say um, electricity products uh, sold through uh, one of the major uh, online platforms. So uh, what we have found is, uh, is a very strong uh, growth, uh, even during the pandemic time. Uh, in China, and not to say you know after the pandemic was controlled, uh, you find a even stronger uh, uh, growth. Actually, much stronger than the growth you see in the last year. That's that's pretty surprising. Another thing is uh, the uh, passenger cars uh, sales. Last year was a very bad year uh, for passenger uh, car sales in China. Uh, uh, the, the last a few months uh, last year in China, you see a kind of two digit decline in sales. Uh, and uh, in in uh, February and March, you also see a pretty a dramatic decline. But after that, uh, the bounce back was, uh, in my impression, I could be wrong, but my impression is the bounce back was uh, quick and strong. And now the sales growth uh, just uh, come back to two digit number again. So uh, uh, it's it's unclear what kind of general lesson we learned from uh, those numbers. Uh, but you know, I'm just uh, showing you guys, you know. Uh, what I know from the, from the Chinese economy. Uh, yeah, it's just two data points. All right, thank you. I have a question myself. Um, so, you know, you, you're focusing on the first year of the recovery of the first five years, um, you know, because usually recessions last five years, as John was, was showing up four years or something like that. Um, but I think like from what I've read with HIV, Ebola, other black death or you know other studies is that you also have an impact on human capital. Oh yeah, there are all these studies on like the 1918 influenza. And for example, when you have a pandemic, uh, you have schools that are closed, um, you people don't go to a doctor, so you have a lot of disease, uh, the incidence rate for the disease is increasing, so you have impact on long-term health. If you have lower income, children don't have are not fed as much, so then you have long-term effect on their health. And, and then with an employment, you have also a lot of young people kind of work, and so you have these uh, work experience losses. So even if you have a recovery in five years, even if you have a Nike recovery in five years, what about the long-term effect on economic development because you have this like, lost human capital? So I'm very interested in the US because interest rates are very low. So you think that you would have more investment in education. We always say recessions are good for education. So we, maybe we're not seeing that. So maybe John can tell us like, what he thinks. And I'm also very curious in China, if like, are people are studying more, studying less, what does that mean for human capital accumulation in China and that for long run economic development? So maybe John, you can go ahead with the US and, and then Michael, you can talk about human capital in China. Yeah, I think it's that's a great question. And I, I, I think it's really going to show up in the data from, from, from COVID, you know, from, from the COVID episode, you know, for, for five years down the road. You know, a lot, a lot of my colleagues on the domestic side the, the, the U.S. Uh, side at the, at the Fed uh, study these issues, you know, carefully and, and, and with good data. And, and we're, we're pretty pessimistic, uh, at least my, my, my colleagues are, is my understanding, uh, about these long-term growth effects. Uh, you know, lo looking at the past pandemics, as I quickly noted on the, my closing slide, you know, the, these current lockdown type policies, stay, stay away from school policies are unprecedented. So I, I don't think that, at least in terms of the educational effects, some of the others you mentioned might have been there. Um, I, I don't think we saw these effects at all in the, in the past pandemics. And so not only are these uh, you know, impact year and, and, and one year out uh, effects, um, that, that we estimate and we talk about in, in this paper uh, relevant to discuss, I, I think you're right, these sort of five, four and five year out long-term effects um, that we don't have much of a, a historical experience with are indeed going to be relevant for COVID. Um, 
uh, again, you know, this is a, this is a very interesting question. Uh, uh, I don't think we know uh, a lot about uh, what is happening uh, in China about the human capital uh, investment. But one thing uh, which I think is interesting is that uh, uh, the government uh, is fully aware of uh, uh, the job market situation. So the government has been encouraging uh, Chinese universities uh, to admit more graduate students. So I think uh, this year you're going to see a big increase in the number of graduate students. Uh, so this in the long run might be contributing to human capital accumulation. However, on the other hand, you also see a lot uh, fewer students going to the US. So on that, uh, you know, the effect is positive and negative. It's hard to tell. Um, so it's, 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 it's a very important issue, but unfortunately we know uh, very little about it. I have one small question for you, Michael, and then after I'll have a more general question for both of you and then we'll be done. Uh, the, the, the question is like, um, someone is asking, why do you see not much growth in retail in your studies? Um, if people are buying cars, but sometimes they're not going to local shop, why is it not going to local shop? And can you tell us which categories of non-durables are particularly affected? I, I thought you had a graph showing like different subsectors, but if you can summarize this for us again, that would be. And I think mean, it's the same as in, in the US, like I've seen all these papers like by Raj Shetty and Glazer and like the US, like other sectors affected the same, whether you're in the US or China? So uh, uh, this is a very interesting uh, question. Actually, I, I didn't, I haven't yet given uh, too much of thoughts to, to this, but my immediate to response uh, is uh, durable consumption uh, might be uh, uh, pretty strong, but you know, non-durable consumption could be much weaker. For instance, just look at the education sector. Uh, 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 the growth of uh, 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 the number of the newly registered the firms in the education sector uh, was pretty weak. That suggests that people are actually spending a lot less uh, uh, on education. So here, education is not um, uh, about you know public education. It's more about uh, 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 extracurricular uh, programs. Uh, so on that part, I think uh, uh, this is greatly affected. But you know, once again, this is an interesting question. Uh, uh, I have to admit, I don't know much about this. I have to uh, look into the data. Hi. Right. The last question, and then we'll finish on time. And I'm going to ask John first, and then Michael, if you want to add something. Uh, this is more of a general question about like, trade in the future. Um, and, you know, based on like what happened with past pandemics and, you know, you see this decline in income and then uh, food trade networks, you have these like spillovers where you're affected if your partners are affected as well. Um, and so you see trade here is like, it's going to lead to a, a stronger diffusion of the shock. Uh, sometimes there may be some backlash against other nations, as, as you have mentioned in the case of China. And so what do you think is going to happen in the next five years in terms of like trade negotiations between say North America, Europe and China, but also at the global level, like uh, the double ETO, you think we're going to have less trade, less, more trade, uh, different trade. Um, so go ahead. Yeah, and then another great question. Thanks, thanks for that, Remy. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit more optimistic since no November 3rd or or whenever it was that uh, that the US election was decided if it's been decided uh, I I also think again I'm just speaking personally here the, 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 these are my impressions uh, the recent signing of the Asia trade deal uh, that that we we sort of we being the US stepped out of in terms of the TPP, you know, might, might, might just turn some heads in the U.S. And, you know, as I mentioned quickly in, in my wrap up, the competition between Democrats and Republicans to, to be fearful of China and to bash China is, is, is strong, at least in public. I think behind the scenes, there's a different approach between Democratic administrations and Republican administrations, but it's a vote winner. To, to bash China, there, there, the studies have shown that over and over again. But 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 I think that the new administration, uh, again speaking for myself, is much more likely to want to rejoin the rest of the world, especially with a fear of China's continued rise, and and that that instead of 
making us step away from the rest of the world and trade agreements will bring us back into them. And I hope so. Okay, Michael, in one minute, if you can tell us if you think that the Chinese government will want to trade more with the US or more with Europe or more with Asia, uh, is it going to be more trade role or more trade with like uh, other partners and you know, the US? Uh, I don't know, you know, what the, the Chinese government is thinking about this, but I think there has always been uh, a very strong demand for uh, opening up the economy further and get connected better with the rest of the world. So the demand comes from uh, uh, the people and also comes from the corporate sector. So I see uh, there is a very strong uh, demand for that. Very good. This has been a we're, we're one time. This has been a very exciting seminar. Uh, Maggie, do you want to add something? I don't know if there's another event you want to feature um, in the coming you know, days or weeks. Um, thanks, Remy. I just want to take the opportunity to thank all the panelists, John, Michael, and Remy for sharing with us really, really interesting and insightful um, research. I have learned a lot um, and um, I'm looking forward to reading your papers in greater detail. I also want to thank the audience for, um, for being here and uh, you know, sharing with all these questions, the very interesting questions. Uh, we will have more events coming up, so please stay tuned. We have, we're going to feature, um, at the moment, we have one event in the pipeline uh, featuring uh, Mike Lapton um, on U.S.-China relations, but from the political perspectives. So stay tuned for our announcement, and I'll turn to James for wrapping up the event today. So thank you all, and I appreciate the participants, the uh, panel members, uh, our co-organizers. Uh, thank you so much for making this go as well as it has, and goodbye from Washington, D.C.